you're watching Sideshow. This is Stephanie, and I'm here with two members of Weezer. First, let me give you guys a quick album review. Okay. It fucking rules. <laughs> On Valentine's Day 1992, aspiring musician Rivers Cuomo went with bassist slash vocalist Matt Sharp drummer Patrick Wilson and guitarist Jason Cropper in hopes of developing a blueprint for future musical endeavors. The unnamed group recorded various songs in Los Angeles using Cromo's 8-track tape recorder in an effort to create a series of demos to share around the LA area. Eventually, in August of that year, much of what would eventually become known as the Kitchen Tape was recorded. Cromo, in an effort to find a name for the band, decided to call his group Weezer, in reference to his childhood. As a kid, children would tease and belittle Cromo due to his asthma, constantly calling him a Weezer. Following a slew of various empty shows around the city, Weezer eventually garnered enough buzz to get attention of various recording studios who were curious of the band's nerdy type of rock and pop. In June of 1993, DGC Records signed a deal with Weezer to produce a studio album. Weezer chose Rick Okasek, famous for his work with the Cars, as their producer and went straight to the recording studio to begin their artistic adventure. During the recording sessions, Jason Cropper left the band and was replaced with guitarist Brian Bell. This group of four awkward geeks gathered together to take a picture for what would eventually become known as the cover art for their self-titled Weezer, or most notably known as The Blue Album, released on May 10th, 1994. Hello everyone, my name is Larry Zeepsterd and welcome! This is a brief analysis slash review series of my favorite band of all time. Together we'll be touring through the band's highs and lows and reviewing and analyzing a lot, and I do mean a lot, of songs. So let's get this show on the road and let's start keeping it wheezy. Talk about a way to say hello! My Name is Jonas is the start of it all and quite possibly one of the most iconic album openers of all time. Hell, this tune even made an appearance in Guitar Hero 3. Holy shit, look at this fucking guy go! The tune is conventional with its progressive guitars and even mesmerizing drums, along with its acoustic riff that's just brilliant. It creates a punchy atmosphere. So for context, the inspiration for this song comes from Rivers Cuomo's brother, Leaves Cuomo, and how he got in a car wreck, and the havoc he had to undergo dealing with insurance problems. Here's my own analysis on what I think the song is about. Remember, this is all subjective. The entire track is a metaphor of the aftermath of car accidents and how much of a pain in the ass it can be. Jonas is the insurance company who is carrying the wheel, hence controlling the next course of action. The insurance company is ironically the driver of the situation. The chorus depicts someone having to pay, likely leaves Cuomo, for a ride they seemingly have no choice to get out of. The second verse immediately starts with another character named Weeple, who received a letter of concern in the mail about his brother, likely a letter detailing how much Leaves owes to the company. So how exactly is Leaves going to pay for this? Well, by going to work of course. But the second chorus details that work isn't going well and that people have been getting laid off from his job. The workers are going home and it seems as if Leaves is being laid off too. The track then ends with one final murmur from Jonas, likely in reference to the fact that Jonas now controls his entire life. Alright, so do you guys want to hear a story about one of the cliniest assholes to ever live? In the second track on Blue, Rivers plays a satirical character of an incredibly overjealous boyfriend, who is obsessed with his girlfriend whatever she does. This boyfriend gets jealous and overprotective when she leaves the house without him, and even when she does something as unimportant as laughing at somebody else's jokes. The ego of this particular individual is in fact, as fragile as a vase. The boyfriend wants total control and ironically, by the end of the song, his jealousy makes him lose control of himself and freak out at this girl. He starts to tell everyone to keep a close eye on her as she needs to be watched. Yikes. It's a creepy song, but I love the guitar riffs. You see, Weezer does this thing where they're making fun of something but also always treading on a truth that can be horrifying. It is a fine line that they walk that can be quickly propped up as uncharming if done wrong. This satirical character is once again followed in the next track. As the follow-up to the last track, the girl has left the Clinny man as he was just too much for her. Now he wanders in his sadness, wondering how this could possibly happen to him. The memories of her keep fading as each day passes by. It becomes difficult for the guy to try and keep his composure. This track is pretty basic and doesn't really need any analysis. The drumming is excellent and the vocal harmonies near the end of the song are extravagant. It's an end to a pretty dark two-parter. Okay, kids. Arnold's is proud to present Kenosha, Wisconsin's own Weezer! What's with this homies, this my girl? Now this 
This is complicated. Way back in the early 1990s, a friend of Rivers Cuomo lent him a Korg keyboard. Cuomo was inspired to write a song with this keyboard when he found that other members of Weezer were making fun of a friend of his, by the name of Kyun Hee. Hence brings forth the question of why exactly these homies of his are dissing his girl. Rivers Cuomo then declares himself to be similar to the legendary 50s rock hero, Buddy Holly, both in terms of looks and figuratively. While his friend Kyun Hee is Mary Tyler Moore, the beaming symbol of confidence and being at ease, Cuomo then starts to try and protect his friend and gets his ass whooped. Simple enough, right? It's just a happy-go-lucky type of song. Well, there's another theory to what this song is actually about, and this one is a little bit more... out there. What's with these homies kissing my girl? There is a theory that suggests that this song is actually about the 1992 LA riots, as evident with the original demo of Buddy Holly. It sounds rather unsettling and sloppy. A slower tempo is presented along with different lyrics. The lyrics, your tongue is twisted, your eyes are slit, specifically describe someone of Asian descent. The presumption is Korean. The bangs and people getting down on the floor depict a violent clash between individuals, perhaps a reference to the destruction of Korean stores throughout the LA area in 1992. Although this would be an interesting perspective, there's nothing to really back this theory up. I'm pretty sure this is just a song about a guy trying to protect his friend. It's just fun and catchy. As a fun fact, originally Chroma wanted to leave this song out of the album as he found it too cheesy at first. Rick Akasek, the producer of Blue, discouraged this action and fought for the track to appear on the main album. It's a silly tale that encapsulates the Weezer sound with a perfect example of their soaring choruses. Culturally, it has its place in alternative rock history with its music video being a parody of Happy Days, and even having the music video packaged with every copy of Windows 95. This track is indeed for all of time. <laughs> Now how could this video be labeled as a retrospect without my own personal two cents on the album and how it impacted me? During the fall of 2017, I was undergoing my first semester of college. While driving home one day, I heard the song Undone on the radio. Now this wasn't my first time I had listened to the song, I had prior experience with it before. But for some reason, this listening in particular really captured me. The weak slash quirky lyrical adventure Cuomo exhibits in the sweater song led me to look up the band once I got home. After browsing through the band's discography, I eventually decided to listen to the Green Album first, and then the Blue Album, and holy shit, I came to realize that the Blue Album didn't have a single bad song on it. The record is so clean and accessible to the average individual. The feeling of despair and teenage angst is very much relatable, and I believe that the middle song of the album perfectly exhibits this idea. Let's take a look. According to an interview with the Rolling Stones, the Sweater Song is the first Weezer song ever written. Rivers was trying to go for a Velvet Underground type of feel, and then created the guitar riff for the track. He goes on to state that it just feels so classic to me, even now when the band starts to play it. It just takes over the energy in the room, and you're just transported into the world of Weezer. The conversation at the beginning of the song between Carl Koch, the man who photographed the Blue Album cover, and Matt Sharp so happens to take place at a party. The one-worded answers by the quiet individual depicts the character Koch plays as depressed and socially inept. The first verse translates into confidence, believing that he can do this. Probably my favorite line of the record, me be, god damn, I am. I love the fake confidence oozing out. The metaphor of the sweater unraveling is pretty obvious. It depicts a mind unraveling to pressure and various insecurities. Michael Allen, one of Weezer's biggest fans, who we'll talk about at a later date, then appears in the song to ask Carl Koch if she can get a ride home. Carl then has trouble responding as he himself is incredibly shy. The music video itself is fairly odd, but in a charismatic type of way. It's one shot with the camera twisting and turning, revealing dogs storming through the stage and Cuomo's ball cut. I fucking love it. As the song progresses, the so-called sweater begins to unravel and so does the relationship Cock has with the girl. In the end of the track, an aggressive piano takes us into darkness and further into the depths of depression. <laughs> Southern Californian bros rise up. It's our time to shine. Weezer's Californian roots are heavily displayed in this simple track about surfing. The protagonist is a surfer who loves surfing and would rather surf instead of taking a car to work. This track is a bit of a tribute to the Beach Boys, one of Weezer's biggest inspirations. The harmonies definitely bulk up this point and so does the bridge. Other than that, it's probably the most optimistic track of the album, especially in regards to what comes before and after. Oh man, and what comes after is just depressing.
It's such a complicated story, way too complex to write a song about. I should have never done it. I was really afraid of alcohol at that time. I didn't drink till I was 21, not even a sip. I was petrified of alcohol. Say It Ain't So was about when I was 16. I opened up the refrigerator and I saw a can of beer. All of a sudden I made the connection that my stepfather was leaving. Because my father started drinking when he left my mother. Our parents are supposedly there to serve as role models of who to become when we become adults. But sometimes fathers and mothers can be a role model of what exactly not to transform into. Cuomo's daddy issues are fully exposed in Say It Ain't So, the most raw track on the album, and a foreshadowing to Weezer's eventual sophomore album in terms of the amount of angst and insecurities exposed. Cuomo's father, Frank Cuomo, had left his family when Rivers was only four. Following his leave, Cuomo rarely saw him, if at all. When Cuomo says that his father has cleaned up and found Jesus, he's specifically referencing his father's transition from an alcoholic to a Pentecostal preacher. Yep, that's right. Rivers Cuomo's father used to actually be a professional drummer who would often incorporate musical elements with his sermons. The track progressively builds on itself, until an explosion of emotions is translated into an aggressive guitar solo. There's a contrast between what is soft and what is hard, with heavy rock being amplified in its most personal bits. The music video was shot in a garage where both Cuomo and Sharp had lived. There's no crazy explosions or special effects attributed to the music video. It's just simple and that's what makes it so great. The music video is so uncool that it just makes the band seem cool. Say it ain't so, in a sense, is the greatest way to summarize the band Weezer. Let's take a deeper look into Rivers Cuomo's teenagehood. Rivers Cuomo, simply put, was a nerd. The eighth track on the Blue album titled In the Garage explicitly tells us why with references having to do with Dungeons and Dragons and his 12 sided die. The song is about the misfits, the ones who are unordinary and spend their time hooped up in a garage. But it also goes deeper than that as Cuomo, lyrically, manages to describe misfits within a song about his own misfit characteristics. Let me explain. The Dungeon Master's Guide Cuomo refers to was one of the least popular used, and the 12-sided die in itself was also an unpopular die in the game. Cuomo references unpopular X-Men, such as Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride. They're no badasses like Wolverine or Professor X, but rather X-Men who merely want to fit in the group. All these things that he likes that would be referred to as normally nerdy is amplified even more with naming the most obscure of objects or characters. These are the outcasts of the outcasts, and that is how Cuomo feels of himself. The chorus for the song is also a tribute to a song by the Beach Boys called In My Room, another introvert anthem that was released in the 1960s. In the Garage, like In My Room, follows similar lyrics, with the idea of only feeling safe inside, as that is where a person can't be judged. They won't be laughed at or ridiculed in any way because they're hiding from it all. Cuomo practices his stupid little songs here, as he feels so unhighly of himself that he doesn't want people to ever listen to them. It would take Rivers Cuomo years until he finally came out of his self-precating shell. Following the acquisition of the record deal with DGC, Rivers Cuomo was booming with optimism and pride for himself. In celebration of the deal, Cuomo wrote arguably the most happy track on the album titled Holiday. At first glance, the song seems to be about a guy going away with a girl on vacation to a faraway land, but in regards to the context of the song's album, I would like to ask the listener to think about it from a different perspective. This song is about daydreaming to adventure to a faraway land, one in which to take a peaceful vacation where current problems seemingly vanish. It is the instantaneous yet anxious emotions of joy into the unknown. The opening lyrics tell of going to a strange and distant land where they speak no word of truth. The key word here is they. They may be the heartless music industry that has given Weezer a chance of success. The industry which speaks no word of honesty and in some ways integrity. To them, Weezer may be just some other trendy band that will be forgotten after this phase known as alternative rock. Holiday is about a chance of opportunity to experience something new and make memories of it. In the bridge of the song, it is revealed that Holiday is also a tribute to the late American novelist poet named Jack Kerouac. Jack Kerouac wrote a book called On the Road, and as found in the bridge, the lyrics detail staying in the Beverack as a tent. The new road the band has started to venture on may ensure that their potential legacy will never die. The final line of going away in a heartbeat is just but yet another pun about Jack Kerouac, as there is a movie about him called Heartbeat. Who knew that Young Rivers Cuomo was such a fan of 20th century American poetry?
The Blue Album holds an incredible set of B-side recordings that are nearly or is just as good as the songs found on the main record. In this video, however, I will only be covering two in particular. Jamie is a song about Rivers Cuomo appreciating his lawyer, Jamie Young, and exploring his crush towards her. In 1993, Young apparently went above and beyond when it came to finding the best interests for the band. The song is recorded in this type of melodic distortion, and offers more beautiful harmonies contributed by Matt Sharp himself. Sharp would later write another song about Jamie in the song titled Miss Young, calling the lawyer his baby and his love. My personal favorite B-side is Suzanne due to the relatable lyrics of a first love and having a mad crush on a girl. To quote, Suzanne was a talented A&R assistant at Jeffen. In the long months of limbo between completing the Blue Album in October 93 and its eventual release in May 94, she became a big Weezer supporter, doing her best to keep the guys optimistic about their future with Jeffen. As the lyrics imply, Suzanne did in fact help Rivers Cuomo out with her spare winter coat when he needed one, and made plates of brownies to cheer him up. Her devotion and aid were perfectly summed up in the song. Before she knew of the song's existence, the guys performed it a cappella for her in her Jeffen office. Needless to say, surprise the hell out of her. The song was also featured at the end of the film Mallrats by Kevin James, featuring the Clerks characters. I do not know anything else about this film besides a random quote. So, I heard you were going to propose to Brandy Spenning in some theme park. When are men going to learn that women want romance, not Mr. Toad's Wild Ride? Be fair, alright? Everyone wants Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Suzanne is beautiful and makes me think of some geeky kid getting the guts to finally reveal his feelings to this girl. However, it is unknown how successful these remarks actually are. Yeah! I know, it's... weird. There's something inside me that's ready to blow like a bunch of fireworks and I... I don't think I can contain it anymore. Ever since I met you, I've just been so entangled with everything about you. The way you crack your smile, the sparkle in your eyes, and the way you laugh along with me. We've been through so much in such a short amount of time, and... And I want to spend even more time with you. You are exactly what I've been looking for. I don't know what's going to happen to us after I say this, but I, I just need to get this out of my system. I think you're pretty cool, and I think... I think I'm falling in love with you. It is the idea of what if that really makes the final record on the Blue Album so extraordinary. There's this motto in media that follows a belief. It is the belief that at the end of the day, the guy will always get the girl and live a happy ending. However, in Only in Dreams, that archetype is rejected with harsh reality. Only in Dreams follows Rivers Cuomo's crush on a girl who he finds above everyone else. It is the story of wanting to tell someone that they mean the world to you, but fear of rejection is the only thing in the way from confessing one's feelings. Only in Dreams is an 8 minute masterpiece and is the longest Weezer song ever recorded, in some ways even considered Gen X's own Stairway to Heaven. Cuomo is intoxicated by this woman, leading to a surreal series of lyrics advertising this person he can only have in his dreams. He wants to seize the moment and hold onto her hand and embrace her, but believes that this objective will be impossible. The entire idea of her mere existence is in the air and in carbon dioxide. It's unknown how long he's felt this way for this person in particular, but seeing her time after time has led him to start shouting in his head only in dreams over and over again. She is unavoidable to him now. The repetition of only in dreams soon vanishes and morphs into a progressive guitar solo. According to a slew of musical interpretations, such as one by Sadie Doyle, Only in Dreams is about masturbation. She tells that, quote, the guitar solo in Only in Dreams is crafted to fit the structure of sex, or really masturbation and orgasm, a slow rhythmic buildup that gets louder and faster and more ecstatic as it goes. Unquote. However, my own personal interpretation is less sexual and more romantic. For me, the guitar solo in Only in Dreams represents a heartbeat, and what goes through the individual's head when they're in love and crushing on someone. Although not directly referenced in the lyrics, the guitar solo in Only in Dreams resolves the fear of not confessing to the other person. As the heart beats faster and faster, the individual is overwhelmed by their emotions. Finally, they cannot take it anymore, and they explode in sheer sensation, revealing the truth. They want to be with this girl, no matter what it takes, and they conquer their fear of rejection. And by the end of it all, for both of them, everything has changed. Wow. 
25 years, huh? At its release, the Blue Album was met with critical praise and success. Weezer's charming geekiness and humorous outlooks led to the band to become a unique one, unlike the others in the grunge and gloom infested 1990s. Not to say that any of those bands during that era were exactly bad per se, the Blue Album means a lot to me and so many others that I still believe I haven't completely done it justice, even as we reach the end of the video. I would love to hear your guys' comments on how the Blue Album impacted you in particular. To Rivers Cuomo, the Blue Album was only just the beginning of highs and lows attributed to the band. Little did he know what mess would follow afterwards. Here's to one of the most accessible and critical albums of the 1990s that transformed alternative rock to what it is today. And as always, thanks for watching. It would mean a lot to me if you liked this video and shared it among circles such as Twitter, Tumblr, or even Reddit. It would help me out a lot. Thanks for everything. I'll see you guys hopefully soon enough.